Thanks very much to the Global Donor Platform for hosting this event uh, with Oxfam. Um, we're quite pleased to be able to share with you the findings for the paper, Financing Women Farmers, the Need to Increase and Redirect Agriculture and Climate Adaptation Resources. My name is Eric Munoz. Uh, I'm a policy advisor with Oxfam based in Washington, D.C. Just a word or two about, uh, about this, this project before I hand things over to Rebecca Pearl-Martinez, who was the uh, consultant who helped uh, with the report, um, and will, uh, she will uh, go through the, the findings. We were interested primarily in thinking about the uh, levels and types of assistance that are going to meet the needs of smallholder farmers and um, also being quite cognizant of uh, some of the international processes that are directing finance for agriculture development, not just um, in, in, in our particular area of interest, CADAP, the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, but also through other uh, global processes like uh, the climate negotiations, the Paris Agreement, which directed um, uh, or made uh, realized donor commitments um, for adaptation finance, some of which is related to um, and relevant for agriculture development. And in thinking about um, sort of accountability around those finance flows, we came to realize that often those conversations happen very independently. That is, you have um, processes for accountability around agriculture spending, and you may have, uh, and where you do have, processes of accountability around finance for adaptation, but those two aren't necessarily talking to each other. And in fact, we don't have a complete picture of how how those flows interact uh, and what uh, the totality of that financing looks like uh, and how it uh, does or does not meet the needs of smallholder farmers. So conceptually, at a, at a very high level, that was kind of the, uh, the issue that we were grappling with. And um, so we started with uh, a series of discrete research projects that were attempting to build a more complete picture across a number of countries. Um, in order to generate a better understanding of, of sort of the landscape. Um, and so that is the, the basis for this project and the, um, and the outcome is this paper that uh, I will very quickly turn over to Rebecca to discuss in detail. As Romy mentioned, um, we want to leave quite a bit of time, if we can, for, uh, for questions and answers and make this an informal conversation because really we see this just as, as one step um, and really an initial step in, in our thinking about this. And so welcome feedback after the presentation. I will um, turn it over to my colleague here, uh, uh, Rebecca, and she will spend about 10 minutes or so going through the, um, the highlights from the report. Uh, and then I have just a couple of closing observations that I will make, and then we'll, uh, we'll open it up for Q&A. So without further ado, um, Rebecca, over to you. So let me get right into it. Um, so I'm going to go over um, the research scope. Um, I'm also going to to touch briefly on the research scope, um, the key findings, and also some of the country findings that stood out to us. And then get in a little bit to the recommendations, um, our broad recommendations across these countries about what governments can do and what donors can do. Um, and I think that might bring us into an interesting discussion after, afterwards. Here you can see the countries where this research was undertaken. Um, Oxfam chose four countries in Africa and two in Asia to undertake this work. And in terms of the um, data points, they identified um, 13 data points under three categories. So the categories that they used was national budget allocations for both agriculture and for climate change, um, ODA for agriculture and climate change adaptation, and then thirdly, international climate finance, including for agriculture. Um, under those three categories, there were all kinds of um, data points we were looking for. They were looking for um, 
sometimes really specific to women, sometimes kind of the, the general spending on these different topics. Um, and I think it was a good um, umbrella to kind of start looking for this information for Oxfam's work. The time frame was uh, we wanted to get the latest data available, which is around 2015 at the time of starting this uh, report, report that we were working on, but also to see the trend over a few years. So we went back to 2010 when possible. So this is, I think, we'll spend a good, just a little chunk of time here to talk about why this is so, why these top key findings are so important. And, and a lot of you on the call have, have done some work on, on gender and can chime in with your ideas as well. Um, but I think this was one of Oxfam's first kind of um, deep look into financing for women's farmers. I, they've done a lot of wonderful work in the past, but I think this was a, an effort to really consolidate um, some of that, the finance portion of it um, on women farmers. Um, and I want to put the, con the, the findings in the context of what these governments have committed to. And one of the primary commitments internationally um, was the 2003 African Union Summit in Maputo, as you, many of you know. They committed, governments committed to dedicating 10% of their national budgets to agricultural development. At that meeting, they also committed to eliminating, gen eliminating gender discrimination in access to economic resources, um, such as credit, training, extension services, land, um, information, technology. So in that context, this slide and the next one talk about six of our core findings. And the two ones on this slide are up front because um, we think they are critical to making the situation better for women, whether we're talking about agricultural and climate change in this report, or really any other sector in relation to getting finance to women. So what we did was we looked for evidence um, that money was reaching women farmers and did not find really any concrete proof that women are actually receiving um, funding. We noted that there are no specific line items reserved for women farmers as well. And we, we're choosing our words carefully here. It doesn't mean that no women are receiving funding, the way we're saying it, but instead the government is not document, documenting or proving any speci specified funding to women, regardless of what they're, they're saying about it. So when there is a political commit, even when there is a government making a political commitment among these countries, or there's a policy or even a budget intention stated in a policy, when we look at the nuts and bolts of the budget, there is no evidence that women are benefiting, no financial um, evidence. Government officials, um, as well as staff of non-governmental institutions, there's also, among those um, people, there's often this assumption, even among my colleagues, that if, if people in a country or region are receiving funding, then a representative proportion of women, um, or any particular group, are on the receiving end in that larger population. But we know that the barriers that are unique to women um, make this very difficult. Barriers in this case, such as women's more limited access to farming inputs, such as land, fertilizer, and technology, financial services, such as loans and subsidies, and technical support, um, <laughs> such as weather information and training through extension services. So uh, the only way to really confirm that women are also receiving the funding um, is to see it in a budget line item or in project results that measure the gender of recipients. So the countries we looked at are really failing to allocate those resources to women, uh, farmers, despite the 2003 Maputo Agreement. Um, and so this next slide that has additional um, findings, um, I'll just go through them quickly. Um, most of the countries are not, the, the six countries that we looked at are not reaching the Maputo target of spending 10% on agriculture, although Ethiopia had actually already reached that target in 2003 when the Maputo uh, meeting happened. So they have continued to meet the target, but they had already met it before. Um, we found throughout the countries that there was funding was, I'm um, using the word skewed, but funding was really strong on the side of infrastructure, capital investments, rather than balanced with investments towards small scale farmers. And we note that, you know, Oxfam finds that, you know, infrastructure and capital investments are often very port important and will help farmers access markets or have irrigation facilities, but it was so skewed to one direction that it really found that there was a need for balance across those kinds of investments, which are helpful for everyone, but also there was more needed on the side of really looking at what small scale farmers needed and specifically women farmers. There was also um, really uh, poor financial tracking systems that are either did not exist or they are very are not used by donors um, or very ineffective in capturing, capturing outcomes of investments. 
So there was information for potentially about um, where the money landed with an agency or with an organization, but not a lot of information about, well, how did it really benefit people? Did it really have an impact? Those kinds of things were really missing. Um, and then national government capacity um, on everything from women's uh, issues in general toward uh, to gender and agriculture specifically was really under supported. Um, the strategies on agriculture and gender that we saw either go unimplemented, such as in Pakistan and Ghana and Ethiopia. Um, the de directorates that were focused on women in agriculture were unfunded, unfunded or underfunded. Um, and so those were some of the other findings that we find found really um, clear across the countries. Um, yeah, just some of the country's findings that stood out here. As I mentioned, Ethiopia was the only one to reach the Maputo target. Um, Ghana's, um, Ghana's spending is obviously very um, skewed toward cocoa. I remember a, a graph that we pulled out on 50% um, of the funding in the years we were looking at, I think almost 50% was going to cocoa, and the uh, directorate or the, the women's um, agency was receiving about 0.5% of the funding on the agriculture. Um, and this is this one right here is about um, climate change. But I think um, there's you know definitely an, a lack of balance um, and a lack of focus on small farmers and especially women farmers. Um, in Nigeria, they had the lowest share of spending on agriculture and rural development um, as part of their international aid, which we find seems to be kind of different than what um, the policy uh, priorities were and what the what people uh, thought was the right um, the right amounts in that country. Um, there was a really interesting study done by Oxfam um, as part of this initiative, um, looking at 13 regions in Tanzania um, and surveyed 3,000 farmers uh, farmers on the ground. And about 80% of them reported not receiving any extension services. So any extension services that are funded in Tanzania, they're really, at least in these, among these farmers, they're not really receiving the support that they need. In the Philippines, um, here's an example of an infrastructure being kind of the only, the most uh, uh, funded um, element of the, the budget. Um, the Public Works Department um, was receiving 88% of climate adaptation funding. Um, while agriculture received just 6%. Again, infrastructure is important, especially in a place like the Philippines where there's a lot of extreme um, weather events, but we also found that, that other priorities were, were not being prioritized. And then in Pakistan, um, we found that almost 99% of the funding for climate change adaptation was in the form of loans um, with, with grants amounting to only 3.4 million. So moving on to recommendations here. Um, these are just a truncated, um, in terms of government recommendations, these are just truncated from the report. You can look at the paper for quite a number of um, other additional recommendations. But um, we wanted to highlight that um, we really need to start allocating resources specifically to women far farmers rather than assuming that these mo this money is trickling down to them. Um, disaggregated data by gender um, throughout agriculture and climate change is really, really key. Balancing support, as I mentioned, across small-scale farming and, and the existing investments and in infrastructure, sometimes in research institutions that where the research uh, um, outcomes are really not reaching farmers, um, uh, capital investments, we really need to see, see more balance across those. And then generally building more financial tracking systems that are transparent and accountable. Um, and this is really something that can be looked at, you know, both nationally and internationally. A lot of some of the donors are not using the tracking systems. And there's not enough coordination in, in the countries to really see how much money is getting to which places and how we can make it better. And then in terms of um, donors, we really um, found sometimes that funding was not necessarily directed to where it was most needed. Um, especially towards small scale, scale producers. So there needs to be more thinking about, um, you know, looking at the poverty incidents and making sure that the money is going to the place where it is most needed. And also a more long-term approach to funding that helps um, diversify farmers' livelihoods and make sure that they can have the, the long-term view and, and be able to building, building up their farms and, and, their, and their businesses. Um, and then secondly, improve reporting on international aid. Um, a lot of the project data and documentation was not really coded correctly or is missing a lot of information. This makes it really hard to do this kind of research, but to kind of get a sense uh, among donors and, and others and um, to, to, to understand what, where we are, a baseline. Um, and then also there was this interesting um, you know, 
you might be aware of the uh, the gender related um, budget tagging that's done through the OECD, and we thought this was really kind of useful in this research to understand where some of the money was going, and we'd like to see that scaled up um, potentially. And I think there's more there's more thinking to do in that realm. So I think I'll stop there and open things up for um, discussion. And I think Eric had some uh, some closing remarks. So just picking up on one thing that Rebecca said about gender disaggregated data. Um, putting women at the center of the conversation is, uh, you know, sort of in this discussion around how much and what types of, of uh, financing uh, and support for agriculture development for smallholder farmers, particularly. We think that that's still something that bears repeating and um, and sort of emphasis. And I would say that um, it's really critical that we think about tracking uh, gender disaggregated data as, a, as the first step in that. So a lot of the recommendations that we make really need to begin with getting a better handle on uh, how much of the uh, current funding is going to women, how are targets being set for inclusion of women in uh, extension services or in um, financing uh, uh, outreach and um, you know and support and other things, um, you really need to start there in order to build out uh, a more comprehensive approach in in agriculture that supports smallholder farmers. And the second thing to highlight quickly that I think is worth um, uh, mentioning is that. I, again, going back to this, um, to sort of the, the, the impetus for this research, we still think that there are parallel conversations happening uh, uh, in the adaptation space and in the agriculture space, and we're not seeing the kind of integration that we think is really important to leverage both sets of resources and ensure that we're building strong uh, adaptive capacity for smallholder farmers. So, um, so one thing to recognize is something on the order of 100 out of 115 of the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions that have been um, have been uh, publicly released by countries indicating how they're going to tackle climate change, include agriculture as a component. Um, that needs to be costed. That needs to be cross-checked with um, with the agri with the ministries of agriculture in those countries, uh, forestry and fisheries, etc., in order to build that kind of comprehensive picture at the national level, and then take that down subnationally. Um, in order to, uh, even in the planning process uh, for budgets on an annual basis, for example, in order to really be able to understand how to apply the adaptation lens to agriculture in a much more systematic way than we currently do. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is just around um, sort of the evidence generation. So we found this uh, this exercise looking at um, at financial flows in in um, uh, for the agriculture sector to be quite challenging. Um, and uh, we recognize that it's um, you know for us uh, on the outside it's it's quite a challenge. Then for uh, sort of national level civil society organizations, um, it can be even more difficult when they have fewer resources to do this kind of tracking um, and analysis. And so we know that there's quite a bit of need for, for increased transparency um, so that all parties sort of have it, uh, the, the information available to them to be able to make informed, um, you know, or to, to inform conversations and debates um, as annual budget process is happening. And we'd like to see this kind of research uh, and analysis that we've conducted scaled up. So we're looking, we would be um, quite interested to take this to other countries and, and sort of perform this exercise uh, in, in, in other countries uh, to, to try and spark that conversation that we're now able to have in a more sort of informed way in the countries where this research has happened. So I think those are a few sort of food for thought pieces um, as we open it up for a Q&A. Uh, first of all, Rebecca and Eric, thank you very, very much. This is uh, very interesting uh, research. One of the problems is it does not come as a surprise, unfortunately. Um, it, uh, it is, uh, so to say, what we expected. But, but um, there are two questions that, that I have. One is, uh, do you, I'm sorry I didn't go through the report, but uh, do you give uh, details on what the investments into, uh, let's say, women-headed households or into farming of women, what the investments would be? You mentioned uh, extension services, you mentioned credit lines or, or, or um, uh, information on weather and so on and so forth. So are you going into more concrete, let's say, opportunities for investments either by the national government, by private sector or by donors? And my second question is, 
uh, do you have one really good example of a country where things are happening, you know, according to what you would like or we would like to see? Because uh, I know in Germany, for example, there is uh, no legal um, provision to uh, to favor women over men when it comes to investments. Uh, it is only that uh, the legal provisions would protect women for, from discrimination, but not that the bulk of finance goes to women. I know I'm sorry to, to ask this question, but the, um, the, the, we had a lady from Kenya talking to us uh, during our annual General Assembly, and she is very strongly after the issue of women cooperation, uh, or let's say cooperations of women-headed households, to give women a legal frame. I stop here. Thank you. I'll give a short answer, but Eric might want to add to this. Um, so do we, do we go through, the question was, do we go through, kind of present opportunities for investment? I think this paper didn't necessarily focus on that, um, but Eric might want to say more about that. We do, I think, you know, Oxfam does a lot of, um, works very, very closely in ver various countries and has a, a variety of kind of opportunities for those kinds of things, but I don't think we focus them in this paper. Um, in terms of the country, I wish I could say I knew which country did this well. <laughs> um, I've been working in the intersection of gender and climate and energy and agriculture for about 20 years, and I've yet to come across an excellent example. Um, there's, you know, I have to think about some kind of good examples, but I think um, we're going to find in most countries that this this lack of data capacity and actually fulfilling commitments is is the norm. Um, I've reviewed a lot of the NDCs and a lot of the NAPAs over the years, and I remember um, many years ago that Bangladesh had an excellent policy, but then it turned out that the the this, uh, implementation of that didn't really happen. So I think we're in a moment right now of kind of um, capturing what's you know where these things are where it's not going well, and if we can come across with a good, good example, um, please, someone, um, raise your hand. But I'll pass it over to Eric, please. So that's, a, that's a great point. Maybe we can crowdsource the, uh, the good examples question, right, if anybody else on the phone has, a, has an idea. And to pick up on the, on the point that Rebecca made, uh, the, the second point that Rebecca made around um, sort of the, the Bangladesh example, we, we do see in a number of countries that the um, what is on paper or what's the legal um, you know, sort of framework governing agriculture is often quite gender sensitive, if not, um, you know, um, uh, uh, pitched towards gender empowerment. However, the implementation of it is often quite weak. The implementation of those laws or those policies is often quite weak. And so that's, that's I think, one gap that we recognize is um, there are good, good laws on the books, good policies uh, that have been put on paper a clear recognition that uh, that women in agriculture need to be supported, that they face um, sort of distinct barriers, either legal or social, that need to be addressed in order for them to reach not only to protect their rights, but also for them to reach their um, their full economic potential. Um, but then when it comes down to sort of budgeting um, and putting in pl place the, the practices that will actually make that happen, there's where we see sort of the gap and um, and, and kind of a lag. Uh, I so from that uh, sort of perspective, I'm not sure that we have a good example per se. Um, although we could point to specific programs, probably, and and I think we do in the paper point to at least a couple of specific examples of where things look better or things are moving in the right direction. Um, the second um, to the to the first question about sort of are we prescriptive. That is a, it's a very fair question, um, and in fact, in this paper, we're not. We're, we tend to focus more on what's not happening um, and where some of the gaps are. We do point out things like, um, as, as already mentioned, finance, uh, um, uh, extension services, access to land, or um, uh, sort of um, programs to register women uh, for control and access over natural resources. Um, research when that research can meet, um, sort of gets deployed and doesn't just stay in the, in the lab or at the university, but actually gets def deployed out to the farmers. All of those are very important areas uh, that um, can be tailored to specifically address uh, um, the unique sort of um, labor demands that women face or, or their place in, um, in value chains and where they're engaging. Um, 
uh, but we don't we don't sort of go through a diagnostic on a country by country basis. I think I think that's a very important exercise to do. This pro and to some extent, it is being done um, at the national level. Uh, I, one question I, I think I, I don't know, have an answer to is whether or not that same kind of diagnostic has been done with respect to adaptation activities. What kinds of adaptation um, programs and and uh, um, and activities and finances necessary to specifically help women improve adaptive capacity. Um, so that's probably something that could be looked at further. Uh, and then we have sort of in other spaces and with other um, other papers, just as other organizations have done, tried to lay out and map out where we think uh, women are um, are not being appropriately supported and where they need to be. Um, I've got uh, two questions, kind of. They're directed at the what donors can do slide, uh, mainly on the first point. Um, so maybe you could just clarify a little bit. I feel like the first bullet point under number one is a little bit disjointed from the rest of the presentation, as it suggests looking for clear budget lines for small-scale producers but doesn't specify female small-scale producers or women and girls. And so I was just wondering if that was a consideration at all when you formulated that point. And then also something that I noticed that was absent from the presentation was when we were speaking or when you were speaking about the climate change adaptation. Um, that's only one side of the story, if I'm not wrong. There's also mitigation and increased productivity. So having more of a whole like climate smart approach rather than just focusing on adaptation. So I was wondering if that was considered at all in your research. Okay, so I would say that one thing we do do in the paper, and again, this presentation really just truncates um, a, a larger uh, paper with more, a lot more detail. So do go there to see kind of our full um, uh, presentation of recommendations. But I think you're right. We didn't specify here um, on uh, the first um, donor recommendation. Um, so w the way I was um, looking at um, this paper and the research we found is one thing I bring into the paper is the idea that um, small-scale farmers in general are facing a lot of barriers, but barriers. It's not just women farmers, but small-scale farmers face as a whole um, a, a, a variety, of, a kind of a layer of, of barriers that make it difficult for them to receive funding. Um, and then women farmers um, secondarily, uh, you know, face a second um, level wave of um, uh, difficulty in accessing resources because of the discrimination and also just kind of the gender inequalities that exist. So, um, you know, this what this uh, recommendation was trying to say was, in general, you know, the small-scale producers are not, um, the, the clear budget lines are not there for small-scale producers, but we should have also put the word um, women farmers as well, because both of those groups are, are in Oxfam's mind, is you know kind of facing a lot of, of challenges. Um, the second, um, what was the second? Remind someone, remind me of the second piece there. Thank, thanks for that question. It's a very good one. Um, we, I think, if we were to look at, at this holistically, including mitigation, certainly the numbers that are indicated in the paper uh, and overall levels of flows would, would look very different. In fact, uh, there's quite a bit more funding uh, going into mitigation than adaptation globally. Uh, and I would suspect that in our selected country set, that is true as well, although it's something that would need to be verified. Um, but the, the question then is what is what are those uh, flows for mitigation activities funding, and what is the impact on smallholder farmers? And I think there the picture would become more complex um, in trying to understand what kinds of mitigation activities at the farm level also contribute to um, uh, uh, to food security and poverty reduction. Sort of the, some of the key goals that we're interested in when we think about agriculture development and the role of smallholders in it. Um, so I, I think there's there's some interest. I think there are some interesting questions that we could ask about the mitigation side of the equation, what it would bring, what it would add, and and um, uh, and what kind of picture it would paint for us. I will say that when we think about issues like climate smart or climate resilient agriculture, 
we as Oxfam still would emphasize that food security and adaptation are probably the primary objectives for, uh, for investing in that space, particularly with respect to smallholder farmers. And mitigation activities may be de delivering less for smallholder farmers in terms of tangible outcomes um, or the, um, the, the projects that are funded might entail greater risk uh, uh, mitigation activities uh, funded for smallholder farmers might entail greater risks um, and therefore are a lower priority. So in the balance of things, um, sort of as we approach this, um, you know, this, this complex set of issues, we're thinking about how do we uh, tackle the food security and adaptation objectives and the mitigation objectives kind of are a co-benefit that we think are important but somewhat secondary from the smallholder uh, um, farmers' perspective, I think you know we would look different if we were looking at other actors in the agriculture supply chain. So that's kind of a bit conceptually why we approach it in this way. Eric, you were suggesting for better coherence or better coordination between the climate adaptation community and the agriculture community. Uh, can you maybe give us some suggestions on, on how do you see that happening? How what can be done? To get there, is it through multi-stakeholder platforms? Is it for uh, certain conditions that donors may apply in um, when giving out funding? What kind of mechanisms could be used to, to enhance this cooperation between the two communities? Let me give you an answer that is is more more targeted to national governments than donors. Oh, that may not be satisfactory for those on the call, but I, I, and I'd invite others to chime in. Um, Rebecca, maybe you have thoughts. But from the, from the perspective of, of um, national governments, what we tend to see is, uh, and I've alluded to this, the conversations tend to be very separate. The Ministry of Environment, for example, may have remit and responsibility over uh, the the NDC implementation, um, planning, budgeting, uh, strategies, etc. While the Ministry of Agriculture um, and sort of ancillaries, livestock, etc., have responsibility over the agriculture budgets. So one one question is: To what extent are these ministries talking to each other in budgeting processes um, and trying to integrate and? You know uh, what are the what are the formal steps in the budget process across all actors where that kind of cross communication and collaboration can occur. When you take this down to the um, to the subnational level, we also understand that you know budgeting and decentralized processes um, uh, involves local uh, government officials who are looking at their own regions, and there they have. You know, the question is, do they have the flexibility to try and integrate some of these um, some of these disparate issues or, or connected issues um, that are being handled disparately? Um, are they bringing those stakeholders together on a regular basis at the community level um, to have conversations about how adaptation, um, what adaptation needs are at the local level? Uh, what kind of funding is available for that? What are the agriculture needs at the local level and how are the conversations around that being handled for, for, um, for the budgeting process purposes? So that's how we think um, a more integrated conversation can happen at those levels. Then you can sort of extrapolate from there if there are particular spaces where donors can play a role in helping to either facilitate those conversations in budgeting processes. Um, or at a more strategic level, designing their own interventions in ways that are um, uh, more integrated. I, uh, sitting in Washington, D.C., and having some kind of um, um, better uh, perspective on the U.S., for example, I can say that um, they have taken steps in recent years um, in their own agriculture development programming to really think about resilience as a core pillar um, and resilience to uh, natural shocks and stresses um, uh, as, you know, a, a core piece of that. And then to think about what are, the, what are the implications for that for their investments in agriculture and food security and nutrition. So sort of from their perspective, the strategic approach of including resilience as, uh, as one piece uh, that they're uh, trying to um, address in their programming um, and in their, in their um, ODA for agriculture is, um, is something that's 
worth looking at. This is a, from USAID's perspective, this is a relatively new um, sort of approach. They've had resilience programming there before, um, and now this, this question of sort of how does it fit with the rest of their agriculture ODA programming is only about a year old. They sort of announced it um, or announced this intention to move in this direction about six or eight months ago, and so I think it's still a work in progress. I'll add quickly to that. Um, thanks, Romy. It's a good, very good question. I think um, doing what Eric just described at the national level internationally would be my first answer, is bringing those stakeholders together in bond, <laughs> sitting down. Maybe you, all of you, um, sit down in bond <laughs> and, and find a way to kind of, you know, have that conversation heightened at the international level. And then the second thing I would say, going back to data again, is if you have the information that the money is not getting to women farmers, um, that is, you know, something that, that shows up for women's ministry, agriculture ministry, and the people working on the climate change um, funding. So I think data will help this in terms of coordination, both interna especially internationally, but also at the national level and local level. For the, for the OECD uh, reporting um, into the development, um, the, the DAC database, sorry, the, the, the acronym's name escapes me, um, uh, very important that we collectively or donors collectively take steps to be more methodical in coding for climate, um, uh, for the investments that are um, related to climate. Um, and to the extent that it's feasible to try and align across donors um, what, that, um, what that coding looks like or what kinds of programs get coded in what particular way. It's a bit of a technocratic exercise. But I think even that gives us a bet, will give us a better sense of where donors are investing, um, how much, uh, to what extent is integration actually happening. We make the case that, um, that we don't think integration is happening enough. It may quite well be that there is more uh, sort of integrated programming that is um, being uh, uh, proposed and implemented through ODA. We're not seeing it because it's not systematically coded in the DAC. My question is related to the last point that uh, was raised relating to what should be done. And I wanted to know in this study, because I joined in lately, but I went through the document quickly. I wanted to know the extent, uh, because most, especially from the African, uh, African countries in the, in the study, uh, the extent to which some of their national agricultural investment programs have been assessed to see if the issue of um, climate adaptation have been adequately mainstreamed in these documents. The reason why I'm asking is because in most of these countries, um, the, 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 the budget for the agricultural sector is is mostly informed by the elements that are in the Agricultural National Investment Program. And, and I tend to agree with the findings of the study, especially where the, the, the consultations in the design of these agricultural investment programs, are, if they are not very consultative to include most of the uh, relevant actors, especially those that are, fall outside the agricultural community but has a stake to play on um, uh, climate um, adaptation issues, then we may have some gaps and then which equally will influence the, 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 the level at which the budgets may be directed to some of these uh, uh, um, climate adaptation issues. So I want to know if some of these selected countries, you have the opportunity to assess their level of how these uh, issues are well mainstream in their national agricultural investment programs. The very good point. That was one of when I mentioned in the beginning, um, there are 13 indicators under three categories that we were looking into. We were really, really, the researchers were really on the ground trying to find that connection between agriculture and climate change. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the background research, um, which is, you know, a number of 35 reports, they have, in some cases, they did kind of look into that more specifically. Um, we didn't find good, um, we did not find adequate investment, as you assumed, um, in that in that uh, nexus. Um, I think in some of the countries, uh, that the background studies, there might be additional information that we did not have uh, room for in the report. So I might 
you know, you might want to connect with Eric or someone at Oxfam to find out there's more analysis that could be shared. Um, but Eric, what else, what else can we say on this topic? I, it's, it's actually a, a really uh, well taken point that actually some of the um, conversations about how we make agriculture more um, climate smart or climate resilient um, needs to happen at the strategic planning level and these uh, all, all of these countries I think or certainly at least the the um, African countries where I'm a bit more familiar have sort of long-term agriculture development plans and um, are those aligned with are they fully taking into account uh, what is being put into the um, NDCs for example or what are the other commitments um, uh, to address climate change that countries are, are taking on board. I don't think that, I think there's a misalignment. My guess is that there's a bit of a misalignment between the planning processes and timelines for under which some of these CADAP plans, for example, in African countries have been made, and then some of the processes around the um, uh, around climate change. And so that, you know, sort of getting the, the timing right where you say, okay, we have a chance now to reassess um, the the agriculture policy for 2019 to 2025 or something like that. And these you know these are kinds of regular um, uh, long-term planning processes and medium-term planning processes that countries undertake. The next one might be a place where we can push to to really uh, try and uh, get at that strategic planning level a better recognition of what needs to happen to make uh, to make the agriculture sector and particularly smallholder farmers. Um, more resilient in the face of climate change. So I, uh, it's, I don't think that we, I can't pinpoint um, off the top of my head where in the research we looked at that um, for this exercise.